Okay. Um, so today we are going to talk about natural remedies and how to determine if they're based in fact and science and evidence, if they're myth, um, if they might help but might be harmful. We're going to kind of dive into all of that today. Um, obviously, there are more products on the market than I can talk about in half an hour. Um, this is a huge topic. So I have picked a few of the more common popular natural remedies that we're going to talk about specifically today. Um, but then at the end, I am also going to give you a lot of uh, websites where you can kind of do your own homework. Um, so if there are products that we don't talk about today, products that you are interested in, that you see health claims for, um, I'm going to give you the tools, the resources for you to look those up, to see if the information is valid, to see if it might be something that you want to do, uh, and to also evaluate how much of those claims are false or possibilities. Um, but I always preface a conversation like this about natural remedies, herbals, supplements, by saying, no matter what you're looking at and what you're interested in doing, before you add anything, please talk to your doctor. Uh, a lot of what we're talking about today are just food products that you would use in everyday cooking. And to use them that way, they are considered safe. Uh, but a lot of times people are taking them in much higher quantities to try to get those health benefits. And we always want to make sure that they are not interacting with other health conditions, with medications that you take. Um, so always run it by your physician uh, and make sure that it's safe for you. Okay. So that being said, let's get started. Uh, and this is my this is my cautionary tale. Uh, today, like I said, today we're talking mostly about food products used as remedies. Um, although towards the end, we are going to talk about a couple of very popular supplements. Um, but I always like to say, when you're looking at supplements, herbals, vitamins, minerals, um, they are unregulated um, by the FDA. So the quality of the supplement that you are taking or the strength, the dosage can vary widely between brands. Um, companies are not required to prove safety or efficacy. They don't have to back up their health claims. Um, and so it's really important for you to do your due diligence, for you to check the company out, check the product out, um, a lot of supplements, we don't have enough research to know what is a safe or effective dose. And so then we're kind of at the mercy of whatever the dosage is on the package that you're buying, uh, which is another reason to always discuss this stuff with your doctor. Um, but just, I'm not saying not to take supplements, um, but take them with caution. Just make sure that you remember these things as you're looking at supplements, okay? So let's jump in. Uh, liquid chlorophyll is making waves on social media, especially on TikTok, um, with people dropping these little dropperfuls of very pretty dark green liquid into a glass of water, just like in the picture. Um, it's very dramatic. Uh, but liquid chlorophyll is being touted right now for a lot of potential health benefits. Um, so what is it? It's, na it's a natural compound and pigment. It gives green plants their green color. So things like spinach or kale or broccoli or algae, the chlorophyll is what's giving it that green color. There are some fat soluble compounds and antioxidants. Um, but the supplements, so this liquid chlorophyll that you see, and sometimes you see it in powder form also, those supplements 
are made from chlorophyllin, which is a semi-synthetic chemical mixture. They're extracting the sodium salts, the sodium coffer salts from chlorophyll and turning it into this supplement. Um, so the latest trend is you mix a dropper or two with water and drink it, and it's supposed to treat acne, prevent cancer, detox your body, and boost energy. So here's what the research has shown so far. There are a few studies uh, that have found with a topical chlorophyll, mild improvement in acne. Uh, the studies did not examine oral supplements or test against a placebo to see if it was a real effect or not. Um, a few cancer studies have been done in animals uh, and they've gotten mixed results uh, of some potential decrease, uh, some tumor fighting properties, or some increased risk of cancer. So we don't really have a, go a good answer on that one. Uh, we do not know if this liquid chlorophyll supplement interacts with any of our traditional cancer treatments like chemo or immunotherapy or anything like that. Um, we said that chlorophyll does have antioxidants and anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, there is a lack of research at this point to say, to, to say that it helps increase energy, that you can use it for detox. Um, I think if, if you've been with me for a while, we have probably talked about the fact that there are um, organs, specifically the liver in your body that kind of do that for you. Um, taking liquid chlorophyll can cause photosensitivity. This is another one that we do not know if there is a safe dose, safe or effective dose, or any medication interactions. It has not been tested in pregnancy, breastfeeding, or children. Uh, and here's what, look, I'm a food first, always, whenever possible kind of dietitian. You are going to get the same amount of chlorophyll from eating a cup of dark leafy greens, like spinach, that you would get in that dropper of liquid chlorophyll. Plus, when you eat those dark leafy greens, you're getting all of the other benefits that come with them. So in, you're not just getting the antioxidants that are in the chlorophyll, you're getting fiber, you're getting other vitamins and minerals. I would much rather you eat a cup of greens uh, than do the liquid chlorophyll. It, at this point, it's hard to say, it appears safe, but again, it's hard to say the dose, um, interactions with medications, whereas a cup of vegetables is a cup of vegetables, okay? Apple cider vinegar is another big one. It's been very popular for quite some time. Uh, vinegar, the vinegar is made from fermented apple juice. Uh, so generally apple cider vinegar has the same nutrition profile as apple juice with the addition of probiotics that come from the fermentation. Uh, it has been used, it's been touted as improving blood sugar control, uh, weight loss, um, a host of other things. I've, I have had some people tell me that they take it just because it's supposed to be healthy. It's supposed to be good for you. Um, and most of the time, people are just drinking a spoonful of it, it, either straight or diluted in water. It has gotten so popular that there are now apple cider vinegar gummies. And now we're not talking about the food product of just going to the store and buying a bottle of apple cider vinegar that we cook with, we make marinades, we make salad dressings, but now we're talking about a gummy formulation and we're branching into that supplement territory that we talked about at the very beginning with all of those kind of possible regulation issues. Uh, as far as blood sugar control, some small studies have shown lower post-meal blood glucose levels, blood sugar levels. Um, it is not a cure for diabetes. It does not replace your di diabetic medication, but it may possibly lower those levels after a meal to prevent the, the spikes that are common after a meal. Um, there was a study looking at weight loss, use of apple cider vinegar to help with weight loss. The study showed that two tablespoons per day of apple cider vinegar plus a calorie restriction and exercise over a 12-week period 
produced weight loss. Now the question is, was it apple cider vinegar that did that or was it the calorie restriction and exercise that did that? Um, that being said, a lot of people do report that in taking apple cider vinegar, they feel that it suppresses their appetite and promotes a feeling of fullness. We don't have a lot of evidence to support that, but anecdotally, that's what, that's what a lot of people feel like it does for them. We don't really have any evidence as far as uh, controlling blood pressure. Um, there have been few small studies with uh, animals or in the lab that vinegar, not specifically apple cider vinegar, but vinegar may have anti-cancer properties when they, you know, when they look at cells in the petri dish. Um, a study in China did find lower rates of esophageal cancer in people who consumed a lot of vinegar, but not cause and effect. They looked at the diet, they found things in the diet, you know, that, that were high consumption, and then they kind of looked at cancer rates. So it's a correlation, but it can't, it's not cause and effect. The other thing of note is that in Asian cultures, they are probably consuming more rice vinegar than specifically apple cider vinegar. So it's hard to say whether those effects were from the vinegar, from their overall diet and lifestyle differences. Uh, and we don't really know if that uh, provides the same result with apple cider vinegar versus the rice vinegar. The other things to consider, uh, if you, drink straight apple cider vinegar, it can erode your teeth enamel. And drinking apple cider vinegar, even if it's diluted in water, getting that extra acid can exacerbate acid reflux. Uh, it is also contraindicated in chronic kidney disease and with certain medications. So very important to talk to your doctor. Uh, raw honey, again, just like apple cider vinegar, uh, the push for raw honey has been around for several years. Um, it has a lot of purported health benefits. And the, the concern for the push for raw honey versus pasteurized honey is the belief that the processing pasteurization process eliminates the beneficial properties that are in the raw honey. Uh, so raw honey, straight from the honeycomb, contains antioxidants, bee pollen. The pasteurization is a heating process to kill yeast cells, bacteria, and increase the shelf life. Um, and the concern is that that heating process is also killing the antioxidants. Um, so the potential benefits of raw honey are antibacterial, wound healing, and the anti-inflammatory effects that you get from those antioxidants. So raw honey does contain phytochemicals, flavonoids, ascorbic acid, or vitamin C. Those are all um, antioxidants that help reduce oxidative stress. There's no specific research on the effect that pasteurization has on those antioxidants. So we don't actually know if the pasteurization is damaging those antioxidants. Uh, from a nutrition standpoint, the nutrition varies depending on the environment, specifically where the bees were pollinating, what flowers they were pollinating. But generally speaking, a tablespoon of honey is about 64 calories, 16 grams of sugar. And they're, they, they do contain B vitamins, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, uh, potassium, zinc. The question is how much, if you're only using a teaspoon of honey in a cup of tea, I'm not sure how much of those things you're actually getting and how much benefit they're providing. Uh, so really, you know, people are, are touting the health claims based on that antioxidant profile. Uh, there is some, there is some research that says, or that shows Manuka honey, that specific type of honey, may help kill certain bacteria and aid with wound healing. As far as allergy relief, and that's very common, I, I have people say, suggest to me all the time that I should take some raw honey to help with my allergies. 
uh, the theory is that the bee pollen in the raw honey will help to desensitize you to the pollen in the air. We don't have a lot of research to support it. Uh, it might help in cases of mild allergies, but it is probably not gonna take you off of your Zyrtec or Claritin or whatever other medications you're taking if you have more significant allergies. Uh, we also don't have a lot of evidence that it's helping to manage diabetes or cholesterol levels, um, although that has been claimed as a benefit also. The risk, of course, is if you have an allergy to bee pollen, you should not be taking any honey. Um, and, and the recommendation is to avoid honey, raw or pasteurized, in infants under the age of one due to that risk of botulism toxin. Coconut oil is another big one. Um, I still hear about it now, although it was probably bigger. It, it, I think it first became very popular maybe a couple of years ago. Um, the health claims range from decreasing belly fat to appetite suppression, boosting the immune system, preventing heart disease, and slowing the effects of dementia. Uh, it is 100% fat just like any other oil or butter. But the difference is that with oils, things like olive oil, um, almond oil, walnut oil, um, even corn oil, those liquid oils are unsaturated fat and are considered more heart healthy. Coconut oil at room temperature is 80 to 90% saturated fat, which is more of what we are concerned about that hurts heart health, that kind of clogs arteries. Um, there are trace amounts of unsaturated fat, but it, it is largely saturated fat. Now the difference is because it is plant-based, it does not have cholesterol like other saturated fats that come from animals like butter. Uh, there's no fiber, but there's no fiber in any of our oils really. Um, there are trace amounts of vitamins and minerals and plant sterols. Plant sterols might help lower cholesterol, but the amount in a few tablespoons of coconut oil that you're cooking with maybe isn't enough to provide a beneficial effect. Uh, and of note, the research that supports all those health claims that coconut oil is good for us in some way, most of those studies, excuse me, were conducted with a special formulation of coconut oil that is made with medium chain triglycerides. Uh, commercial coconut oil that you buy in the store is not made with medium chain triglycerides. They're made with the regular longer chain triglycerides. Medium chains behave differently. They're quickly absorbed. They're used as energy without being stored as fat. Uh, and so they do have a tendency to promote fullness and help with like appetite suppression, but you're not gonna get that, like I said, from commercial coconut oil in the store. So a lot of the research that shows those health claims can't be translated to, the, to regular coconut oil that you're gonna buy. Um, so in multiple studies of, uh, of regular coconut oil, it was found to raise all of your cholesterol levels. So it did raise the good cholesterol, the HDL, but it also raised total cholesterol and LDL, the bad cholesterol. Um, the effects on LDL were similar to other saturated fats like butter and increased it more than unsaturated fats did. Uh, those same studies did not find a significant effect on body weight, waist circumference, body fat percent versus any other vegetable oils. So they couldn't, they couldn't prove the weight loss claims with coconut oil. Um, of note, the American Heart Association recommends no more than 13 grams of saturated fat per day that's based on a 2000 calorie diet. Not all of us eat 2000 calories a day. So then our amount would be less than 13 grams, uh, but, but no more than 13 grams of saturated fat for people at risk of heart disease. Uh, so just to be aware that 
you know, a, a tablespoon of coconut oil is 12 grams of saturated fat. Okay, that's your, if you're at risk for heart disease, that's it. That's your saturated fat for the day. Um, so that means if you, if you use a tablespoon of coconut oil that day, no meat, no eggs, no butter, no animal products, because they're all going to add in some extra saturated fat. We're moving on to mushrooms, and I'm not talking about mm, any other thing other than the edible mushrooms you buy in the grocery store and eat or cook with, okay? Uh, mushrooms have been used in Asian countries and cultures to, for years to treat lung diseases. Uh, they are sometimes used alongside traditional cancer treatments. Uh, like chemo. Um, at this point, we do not have any evidence that mushrooms or mushroom extracts can treat or cure cancer. However, there is new research from Penn State. They did a big systematic review uh, of 17 cancer studies dating from 1966 to 2020. They pulled data from almost 20,000 cancer patients and they found a correlation. So again, not cause and effect, just a correlation for, so that people who ate 18 grams of mushrooms daily coincided with a 45% lower risk of cancer versus people who didn't eat mushrooms at all. 18 grams of mushrooms, sounds like a lot, right? You're like, mm, I don't know if I could do that every day. 18 grams of mushrooms is one medium mushroom. So essentially, they found this correlation that people who ate one mushroom a day had a 45% lower risk of cancer. Uh, again, not cause and effect, but very interesting new research. Uh, mushrooms are, again, full of antioxidants. Uh, and so the thought is that they are helping to boost the immune system. They contain B vitamins, potassium, and specifically ergothionine and selenium, which are potent antioxidants. Eating mushrooms as part of a healthy diet is considered safe. We are not talking about mushroom supplements or extracts, which are typically much more concentrated. We don't really have research on the supplements and any uh, interactions or contraindications with other medications or, or health conditions or other supplements or herbs that you might be taking. Uh, so again, food first, I would much rather you just incorporate them into your diet, okay? So I said we were going to talk mostly about food, but there were a couple of supplements that I wanted to throw out there because they've been so popular. Uh, collagen, it has been super popular. It's typically a powder that you mix into water or coffee and, and drink it. Um, collagen itself is one of the most abundant proteins in the body, forming connective tissue. Um, and so it contributes to your skin elasticity, muscles, tendons, ligaments. And the problem is that collagen production in our body decreases as we age. Uh, so there is a lot of interest in taking collagen supplements um, to help with skin, wrinkles, nail strength, joint pain. Uh, so that being said, there are some small studies that showed the supplementation of collagen improved skin elasticity and joint pain. Um, they are considered safe for the most part. The studies did mention that topicals are unlikely to be very effective because they can't penetrate deeply enough uh, to, to have any benefit. Uh, and then of note, there are some plant-based collagen products on the market. Uh, and it's important to know that those do not actually contain collagen because collagen is the connective tissue. It's the protein from animals. Uh, so that being said, a lot of the sources of collagen supplements are common allergens, uh, like eggs or shellfish. So bear that in mind if you're considering using a collagen supplement. 
And then ashwagandha, I'm seeing it everywhere lately. Uh, and again, the health claims vary widely. Uh, reasons that people are taking ashwagandha. Uh, anything from improving energy levels, improving overall health and longevity, treating pain, uh, improving diabetes control, rheumatoid arthritis, brain function, treating cancer, aiding in weight loss. There's very minimal research in animals or in vitro. There's even fewer human studies. We do have some limited evidence of anti-inflammatory properties or anti-stress benefits like reducing anxiety. Um, it is considered safe to take it short term, considered safe, but that's not including potential interactions. We do not know long-term side effects of taking it. Uh, also to, to consider the ashwagandha is often mixed with other herbs or supplements into like one power supplement. Uh, and so those other ingredients may be contraindicated for you. Um, ashwagandha itself can sometimes cause GI upset or drowsiness. So if you are already taking a sedative medication, you do not want to take ashwagandha. Uh, and it is not appropriate if you are pregnant. That ashwagandha can have negative impacts on the pregnancy. Um, it does, it might increase testosterone levels. So if you have a hormone sensitive prostate cancer, uh, this could potentially interfere with your treatments. So again, really important to talk to your doctor before doing something like this. And again, this is another supplement where we don't really have information on a safe or effective dosage. Uh, so if you were to have a visit with me and ask if you could take ashwagandha, I wouldn't be able to tell you how much to take to, to get the benefit or to, or to make sure that it was safe for you. And as promised for your own homework and interest, these are some very reliable resources to kind of research the product, the health claim, the efficacy, the safety. Uh, there are some sites on here that are specific to supplements used in cancer um, or their interactions with cancer treatments like Memorial Sloan Kettering's website, the National Cancer Institute. Uh, there are also some bigger databases uh, the National Institute of Health Office of Dietary Supplements, the Natural Medicines Comprehensive Database, uh, and then Quack Watch, I really like, that if there are some new fad health claims, you can kind of do some preliminary research on Quack Watch to see if it's more of a legit claim or more of a myth that's being circulated. Uh, and so I strongly encourage you to use these resources uh, to check products that you're interested in before you make decisions. And again, always, always, always have that conversation with your doctor to make sure that it's safe for you to do one of these things or any of these things, given your situation, your health, medical conditions, other vitamins or treatments or medications. Uh, so that's my presentation. We're at the end. I nailed it in 30 minutes. <laughs> but we have a couple of minutes. If anybody has questions, um, I have the chat box open. I have the Q&A box open. Um, so before I let everybody go, please feel free to ask me questions. If it's a supplement I'm not familiar with, which is totally possible, I may refer you back to this list of resources. <laughs> okay. I am not seeing any questions. I appreciate all of you sticking with me for this half hour. It's a lot of information. Um, did I research anything about supplements for COVID? I didn't, and that's a great question. Mainly I didn't because I wanted to focus more on these natural food remedies that, that people are using lately. Uh, and I didn't really wanna get in too deep into supplement use. Um, and the information on COVID is still so new. 
that I'm not sure I'd be able to tell you at this point if, if they are necessary, helpful, effective. I think we're still learning in that regard. Uh, but specifically, I didn't uh, look at those for this particular presentation. There's been a lot of talk about vitamin D specifically for COVID. Um, I will say, I don't know if it really is helping, uh, but I can say that many of us are deficient in vitamin D, either because we don't drink enough dairy or we don't get out in the sun. Um, and so it may be worth having that conversation with your doctor to check your vitamin D level and see if you would benefit from a supplement. Um, the pending article from New England Journal of Medicine, I'm sure. So, you know, we, we've been in this for a good year. They've been doing the research. They've been looking at supplementation. I'm sure that we are going to be getting data uh, in the very near future. Um, yeah, but that's about all I can weigh in on COVID at this point. All right, thank you everybody. I am gonna let you go. I am past my 1230 mark, but thank you for being here and listening. Like I said, the presentation is recorded. Next month, uh, we are doing um, a virtual teaching kitchen. Again, we're gonna be cooking. We're doing some Greek turkey burgers for the summer grilling season. They're delicious. I hope that you all join us. Um, so, Thank you very much, and I hopefully will see you next month.